Good afternoon, everyone. I'm delighted to kick off the afternoon portion of Radcliffe Day 2022. And as I do so, please enjoy your lunch. Let me start by congratulating the Harvard College Class of 2022. I'm also very happy to welcome members of the classes of 2021 and 2020. And we're looking forward to celebrating your in-person commencement over the next couple of days. And of course, we're thrilled to be joined by all of our Radcliffe alumni who are celebrating their reunions in the coming days. Let me extend special congratulations to the classes of 1997 and 1972, who are celebrating their milestone 25th and 50th reunions. We're also happy to be joined by a number of special guests today, and I'll ask them please to stand and be recognized. First, our president, Larry Bacow. Provost Alan Garber, I'd also like to welcome many other university leaders who are here today, including Vice Presidents, Vice Provosts, and other senior leaders, Harvard Deans, members of the Harvard Corporation, and members of the Board of Overseers. And speaking of which, I'd like to extend a very special Radcliffe welcome to Associate Justice of the United States Supreme Court, Katanji Brown Jackson. Woo! The Justices Harvard Radcliffe class of 1992, and know that we've always got your back. It's also a particular pleasure to welcome several members uh, who are former Radcliffe medalists here today. They include Linda Greenhouse, <laughs> the Honorable Margaret Marshall, and Donna Shalala, who of course spoke in our morning panel. I'm also happy to welcome current and former Radcliffe Fellows who are joining us this afternoon. And of course, none of the Institute's work would be possible without the dedication and the generosity of our advisory council members and our donors. I'd like to recognize current and former members of the Radcliffe Institute Dean's Advisory Council and the Schlesinger Library Council, as well as members of the Radcliffe Institute Leadership Society, the Ann Radcliffe Society, and the Radcliffe Associates. Thank you, and thanks as well to all our generous donors. This afternoon, I have the honor of presenting the Radcliffe Medal to Sherilyn Eiffel. But first, I'm pleased to share a special video message from Brian Stevenson, the founder and executive director of the Equal Justice Initiative and the best-selling author of Just Mercy. I am so excited to have this opportunity to celebrate the work and life of the extraordinary Sherilyn Eiffel. Sherilyn is a force of nature. She's had such an impact on issues of justice in this country that I'm thrilled that Radcliffe is honoring her in this way. I wish I could be there in person to tell you about this amazing human being. Sherilyn and I go way, way back. We met each other when we were young lawyers. She was at the NAACP Legal Defense Fund 
doing incredibly important work on voting rights and education. I was representing people on death row. But when we met at Airely, uh, the gathering place of civil rights lawyers for generations, I was immediately struck, not just by her brilliance and her intellect, but her character, her wit. Uh, she's hysterical. And if you get the experience, Sherlin's humor, then you know what a rare and precious human being she is. But we also talked about the complexity of the issues we face. We talked about the challenges. We talked about the weight of what we were trying to do. I've been so inspired to watch her career. She continued to advocate. She's never not been an advocate. When she was teaching and doing groundbreaking work as a law professor, she insisted that her students not just learn, but understand. And I'd meet some of her students who would talk about her with such excitement and enthusiasm. She is a scholar of the first order. Her groundbreaking book, On the Courthouse Lawn, lifted the veil on the trauma connected to our history of racial injustice. Too many people in this country for too long have wanted to turn the page before we'd actually done the reading. Sherilyn's work forced us to confront the consequences of decades of lawlessness. At the end of the Civil War, we passed a 14th Amendment that guaranteed equal protection, a 15th Amendment that guaranteed the right to vote, but our legal institutions failed to enforce those laws. And for a century, black people were pulled out of their homes. They were beaten, they were drowned, they were tortured, they were lynched. And, Ker and Sherilyn's work exposing the violence and the terror of that era was critical to understanding the moment that we're in now. On the Courthouse Lawn was a seminal book that forced so many to reckon with the fact that we are far from post-racial. And of course, over the last 15 years, we've seen the consequences of that failure to reckon. When Sherlin became the head of the Legal Defense Fund, I was worried that the complexities and the challenges of the moment that we were in would be a lot for any one person. Not only did she meet all of those challenges, I think she's exceeded any reasonable expectation. LDF is as strong and as vibrant as it's ever been. And standing in the footsteps of extraordinary people like Thurgood Marshall uh, Elaine Jones is not an easy task, but I'm going to contend that no one has shown the tenacity, uh, the leadership, the innovation, the brilliance in leading that remarkable institution more than Sherlyn Eiffel. She is a force of nature. She is extraordinary. I had the pleasure of being at a meeting uh, where people had just heard her speak somewhere. And one of the folks said to the other person, wow, how is she so incredibly compelling and persuasive and articulate? I didn't see any sort of prompter, and I just can't imagine how she should be giving that. She must have artificial intelligence. And I couldn't help but say there is nothing artificial about the intelligence of Sherlyn Eiffel. Uh, she came up the rough side of the mountain. She earned and learned her way uh, through all of the things that needed to be understood to be an advocate, to be a force that changes and lifts up justice. I can't think of someone more deserving of this honor and recognition. I'm still excited to see what she will do. Knowing Sherilyn, I know that she will not rest until the cause of justice is fully realized. I love her character. I love her spirit. I love her courage to stand up when people say sit down, to speak when people say be quiet. I could not be more thrilled uh, to contribute in some small way to the recognition and the accolades and the achievements that Sherlyn Eiffel presents to all of us. Congratulations, Sherlyn. I wish I could be there. And thanks for everything you have done to advance justice in this country. Terrific, thanks to Brian for that. And now it is my distinct honor on behalf of the Harvard Radcliffe Institute to recognize one of my personal heroes, Sherilyn Eiffel, as our 2022 Radcliffe Medalist. Mm. Sherilyn has dedicated her life and career to fighting for equal citizenship rights for all Americans. Leaving no power on the table, as she said, 
Sherilyn has harnessed scholarship, education, community organizing, and the law to protect and advance civil rights in the United States. As President and Director Counsel of the NAACP Legal Defense and Educational Fund, only the second woman to hold that role, Sherilyn led the historic organization through profound growth and transformation during her nearly 10 years at the helm. From voting rights to economic disparities, education equity to criminal justice reform, Sherilyn's work at LDF helped shape this nation into a more perfect union. Now LDF President and Director Council Emeritus, Sherilyn continues to fight for racial justice and to uphold our nation's highest democratic ideals. For Sherilyn, civil rights work is vital to the health of the nation. To quote her again, at its core, civil rights work is the work of democracy maintenance. As citizens of this country, it is work in which we all have a part to play so long as opportunity and justice remain elusive for any segment of our society. The youngest of 10 children, Sherilyn grew up in New York City in a family devoted to the pursuit of justice. And speaking of family, I want to note that this is the first instance of a Radcliffe medalist who is related to a past honoree. Just a few years ago, my predecessor as Dean, Liz Cohen, posthumously honored Gwen Eiffel, the path-breaking journalist and Sherilyn's beloved cousin. We're proud to recognize another member of this remarkable family. Sherilyn's mother died when she was just five years old, and her father, a social worker, ensured the family was engaged with politics and community life, particularly around issues of racial equity. From a young age, Sherilyn knew that she wanted to be a civil rights lawyer. Young Sherilyn also loved school, and she excelled academically. The Civil Rights Act of 1964 had barred provision of federal funds to programs engaged in discrimination, which accelerated school desegregation efforts in the North. Beginning in kindergarten, Sherilyn was bused from her neighborhood in Jamaica, Queens, to a public school in Flushing. She was a gifted student, though apparently some teachers said she talked too much. <laughs> Fortunately, Sherilyn was undeterred. She recalled, quote, I knew I was smart, and I had something to say. And her father told her that she was destined for great things. She drew inspiration from the black women leaders she saw on TV, especially Shirley Chisholm and Barbara Jordan. She explained, they commanded power by their strength and smarts and moral authority. For Sherilyn, these women affirmed that she too could be a leader who used her voice to affect change even if others told her to keep quiet. After high school, where Sherilyn thrived in an environment of academic rigor, rich extracurricular opportunities, and diverse, a diverse student body, she earned a scholarship to Vassar College. Hillcrest High School had prepared her with the tools for success, and succeed she did. This experience solidified her belief in the power of public education, and it animates her enduring commitment to fighting for educational opportunity for all. After graduating from Vassar with a degree in English, Sherilyn attended New York University School of Law. As a student, she clerked for path-breaking judge A. Leon Higginbotham and interned at the United Nations in Geneva. After graduation, Sherilyn spent a year as a fellow at the American Civil Liberties Union before joining LDF as an assistant counsel. During her first stint at LDF, she litigated voting rights cases alongside senior attorneys Pamela Carlin and the late Lonnie Guineer. 
a beloved Radcliffe College alumna and the first African-American woman appointed a tenured professor at Harvard Law School. Sherilyn also looked up Sherilyn also looked up to Constance Baker Motley, who shared insights on navigating a demanding career as a civil rights litigator and a mother. Sherilyn's very first case at LDF, which concerned Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act and its application to state judicial elections, went all the way to the Supreme Court, and she won. <laughs> In 1993, after five years at LDF, Sherilyn joined the faculty of the University of Maryland Francis King Carey School of Law, where she taught civil procedure and constitutional law. She also established one of the nation's first clinics dedicated to challenging the legal barriers to reentry for people formerly incarcerated for felony convictions. In another legal clinic, Sherilyn and her students pursued environmental justice. It was this work that brought Sherilyn to Maryland's Eastern Shore, where she also learned about horrific lynchings that took place there in the 1930s. That research led her to write the landmark book Brian Stevenson mentioned, titled On the Courthouse Lawn, Confronting the Legacy of Lynching in the 21st Century. In the book, Sherilyn uncovered the enduring effects of the nearly 5,000 lynchings that occurred in this country between 1885 and 1960. 1960. She concluded, quote, more than the poll tax, the grandfather clause, and Jim Crow segregation, lynching and the threat of lynching helped regulate and restrict all aspects of black advancement independence and citizenship in many small towns for half a century. Sherilyn traced how lynchings, though long shrouded in silence, were in fact public crimes, witnessed by hundreds, sometimes thousands of people, and often carried out in front of courthouses meant to uphold justice and equal protection of the laws. She issued a powerful call for communities to engage in a project of truth and reconciliation. As Brian Stevenson has written, Sherilyn showed us why we cannot stay silent about our history of horrific injustice. After 20 years at the University of Maryland, Sherilyn returned to LDF in 2013, this time as its seventh president and director counsel. For Sherilyn, her return to the organization she'd always considered her professional home was a natural next step. She said, quote, I had a perspective to bring to the table and I had all of these experiences. I felt like I was packing my suitcase for 20 years to come back to LDF. And she would need all the skill that she had developed over those years. Just six months into her tenure, the Supreme Court struck down key provisions of the Voting Rights Act of 1965. A year later, Michael Brown and Eric Garner were killed by police. The U.S. was entering what Sherilyn has called a long overdue period of self-confrontation. Sherilyn articulated a vision for LDF that met this moment. The storied organization would do nothing less than pursue structural changes to fulfill the promise of equality for all Americans. A central pillar of this vision was to marry LDF's long-term and forward-looking approach to structural change with the imperative to respond quickly to emergent issues and to anticipate challenges. In other words, to play defense and offense, as Sherilyn has described it. She strengthened LDF's rapid response capacity and built a grassroots organizing division, and she launched a research arm called the Thurgood Marshall Institute. Under Sherilyn's leadership, LDF was a key player in protecting voting rights, advancing education equity, closing racial disparities, and reforming policing and the criminal justice system. 
during the COVID-19 pandemic, which has disproportionately impacted black and brown communities, LDF issued school reopening recommendations to promote education equity. As a part of a civil rights coalition, it also filed a federal class action to permanently stop Detroit's longstanding water shutoff policy for households with overdue bills. It challenged voter suppression laws, represented peaceful protesters in North Carolina, and sued the U.S. Postal Service over planned mail shutdowns impacting the 2020 election. And that's just a small fraction of LDF's work. Sherilyn also raised the organization's visibility outside the courtroom, establishing it as a trusted source of information about racial justice and inequities. Sherilyn's own talent for distilling complex subjects has made her a respected voice, shaping national conversations about pressing civil rights issues. In a profile of Sherilyn for Glamour's 2020 Women of the Year Awards, the journalist Melissa Harris Perry remarked, Sherilyn has a staggering capacity to connect the dots, complete the puzzle, and reveal what links the past to our present struggles for justice. It is a rare skill. For Sherilyn Eiffel, it's a superpower. All the while, Sherilyn was safeguarding the future of LDF and civil rights work. During her tenure, LDF's endowment grew by nearly $100 million, its annual budget grew five-fold, and its staff expanded from 55 to more than 150. And in partnership with her close colleague and successor as head of LDF, Janae Nelson, Sherilyn established the Thurgood Marshall Constance Baker Motley Scholars Program to support the next generation of civil rights lawyers in the South. Yes, through law school scholarships and professional development opportunities. Even Sherilyn's decision to step down as director counsel reflected her commitment to future civil rights leaders. Transition, she explained, is part of leadership. Janae Nelson aptly summarized Sherilyn's impact when she said, quote, she has left a legacy of transformation and fortification. She fortifies individuals and institutions and shows that organizations like LDF cannot be taken for granted. They are necessities to a democracy that is still quite young and fragile. But stepping down from LDF doesn't mean Sherilyn is stepping back from her life's work advancing civil rights. Among other projects, she's now hard at work on a book examining racism's enduring effects on our democracy and exploring how to strengthen our democratic institutions. I, for one, am very much looking forward to all that Sherilyn will accomplish in this next chapter. I'm thrilled to honor Sherilyn today because she is quite simply a generational leader, pushing our nation to live up to its highest ideals. In just a moment, I'll welcome Rachel Maddow to the stage to deliver a testimonial to Sherilyn's impact. Rachel is host of the Emmy Award-winning The Rachel Maddow Show on MSNBC. She's also the author of several books, the most recent of which is Bagman, The Wild Crimes, Audacious Cover-Up, and Spectacular Downfall of a Brazen Crook in the White House. After Rachel's testimonial, Sherilyn will engage in a keynote conversation with my esteemed colleague, Martha Minow. Martha is the 300th anniversary university professor and the former dean of Harvard Law School. She's the recipient of many honors and the author of numerous publications. Her most recent book is Saving the News, Why the Constitution Calls for Government Action to Preserve Freedom of Speech. And now, it's my distinct pleasure to welcome Rachel Maddow to the stage. Wildly uncalled for. Very good. Oh, good afternoon. 
Um, my name is Rachel Maddow. Um, <laughs> I, um, I host a news show on a TV network called MSNBC. For those of you um, who are under the age of 50, a TV is a vintage household appliance. Um, it's this big, energy-efficient screen device that your parents own. Um, but it's way less convenient for watching things when compared with just your phone. Um, I am not a lawyer, uh, but there is one rule of thumb for hosting a TV news show that I've been told uh, is the same rule lawyers are advised to follow when litigating a case in the courtroom. And that is, when you are asking questions of, in my case, an interview subject in the courtroom, a witness, never, 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 never ask a question to which you do not know the answer. You don't bring a witness up to the stand in front of the jury because you are wondering in that moment what they might have seen during the bank robbery. You know what they saw and your questions are designed to elicit that testimony that you are counting on for your case, right? On cross-examination, when it's the other side's witnesses, you are not curious as to whether or not there might be some contradictions between the courtroom testimony from that witness and the account they previously gave in deposition. You know that there are contradictions and your questions are designed to elicit that. Right? It's the, it's, those of us who aren't lawyers know this about good lawyering. You may not know that it is the same thing in TV news. But you know, it's the same principle applies. You don't tell the audience about the plane crash or the assassination or the new treaty that's being signed and then bring on an expert guest, a reporter, a lawmaker on the off chance that they might know something about it and let's find out here live on the air. I mean, we look all over the country, sometimes all over the world, to find the person who knows, who has the right expertise, the relevant experience, and the explanatory capacity to add more to what we have thus far been able to explain. And the dirty secret is that we figure that out, the question of what they have to add. We figure that out before we put them on TV. Um, and then, Hopefully, like a good, well-prepared litigator in the courtroom, we ask questions to elicit that contribution that we know already they have to offer. And it is a hard and fast rule. It, it applies even to most breaking news situations. If I'm going to a reporter at the scene of a crash while the wreckage is still smoldering behind her, I'm going to know before I go to her that she's going to be standing in front of smoking wreckage and that she saw the crash happen and she's going to be able to say what it was. So it, it is a rule. In my career, it is a rule that really does not have exceptions, except for one, except for Sherilyn Eiffel. The rule for Sherilyn Eiffel, and for her alone, uh, is this. If she can be there, if she can make the time and she agrees to do it, give her the microphone and get ready to learn something that you do not already know. And I say this not to help you all book your future cable news shows. I don't know how much longer there will be cable news shows. Um, but I, I say this without hyperbole. I don't know of another person like that in public life in America. And in, in honoring her today with the Radcliffe Medal, you are, of course, honoring her for her accomplishments, which, of course, are legion, um, and which the dean just so beautifully summarized. I mean, from leading a landmark voting rights case to the Supreme Court when she was four years out of law school, to quintupling the budget and the endowment of the Legal Defense Fund and tripling the staffing of the Legal Defense Fund over the course of less than a decade at the helm, from on the courthouse lawn, as Brian Stevenson just explained, her searing and I think also intensely practical analysis of lynching and its moral aftermath, to founding one of the first clinics in the nation helping to break down legal barriers for recently released prisoners trying to make a new life, a new life for themselves in the community, and a clinic on environmental justice, and a clinic on reparations. From the Marshall Motley Scholars Program to the Thurgood Marshall Institute, from reigning in the Trump administration kangaroo court commission on make-believe voter fraud, 
to stopping the deliberate slowdown of the mail part of mail-in ballots before our last election, to keeping the water on in Detroit. You know this stuff about Cheryl Eiffel. You are honoring her today for her outstanding record, her singular record as a leader, as a fighter, as a litigator, as an organizer, as a builder of institutions, importantly, as a builder of black institutions, as a victor in valuable fights, fights well-picked, fights hard-fought, and fights honorably won. And she is all of those things. But she is also something that is legitimately quite rare, a job for which there are a lot of pretenders and very few real deals. She is a public intellectual of the highest order. She is both a public intellectual and a moral force, a moral leader. And we do not grow those in America in quantity. Her voice is not just one of intelligence and accomplishment. It is a voice of authority. It is a voice with gravitas well earned. Sherilyn Eiffel is not someone of whom you just ask questions. You ask her what we ought to be asking, and you get smarter by her answer to that. Getting to speak to Sherilyn in a, in a news context is not something you do because you need a question answered. It is something, because, something you do because you want to learn how to think better and think harder about the questions of our time. And I will ask uh, Judge uh, Brown Jackson to forgive me, I'm gonna say something weird about the Supreme Court here. You can close your ears if you don't wanna hear it. <laughs> but because of the type of public intellectual moral leadership role that I'm describing um, for Cheryl and Eiffel, I think that's an important sort of singular distinction about her to understand something that happened recently over the last couple of years. There has been an unled, uncoordinated, legitimately spontaneous and organic movement across the country to promote to President Biden the idea that Ms. Sherilyn Eiffel should join Justice Ketanji Brown Jackson as an Associate Justice of the United States Supreme Court. And there is no you know, Federalist Society conveyor belt to the court for a potential nominee like Sherilyn Eiffel. There is no donors network uh, or favors pipeline or backdoor corporate whisper campaign pushing a potential nomination for Sherilyn Eiffel. What there is, is everyone who has ever worked with her or worked for her or spent time with her or heard her speak. That is the constituency. That is the ad hoc organic pressure group that wants a moral clarion, a brilliant, innovative, tested, fearless leader, scholar, lawyer, icon like Sherilyn Eiffel to join the court. And maybe that will happen someday. Maybe it will not. I don't know. If I did know, I wouldn't tell you because me telling you might screw it up and I couldn't live with myself. Honestly, if you find out it is going to happen, do not tell me in advance because I will blab about it. That will screw it up and I will never be able to live with myself again. But the, the reason we're here today, uh, the reason this medal is rightly being awarded to Ms. Eiffel today is at its core very simple. There just aren't very many people. There aren't many, uh, there aren't maybe any other people in the country that can lead us publicly, particularly on justice issues, not just in what to think, but as Brian Stevenson said, in how to think. We are entering a period in our democracy where we don't know if we will be a democracy at the end of it. And I'm talking about a very short horizon when I say that. We need leadership and ideas and explanation and inspiration and honestly a hand on the tiller from people like Cheryl and Eiffel as we row into this next very dangerous patch of whitewater between now and the end of 2024, which means I'm talking about a horizon of just two and a half years. Cheryl and Eiffel thinks big we are fortunate as a country that what she thinks about most is justice. The Radcliffe Medal is a rarefied honor. It is bestowed in the past on Supreme Court justices, on secretaries of state, on attorneys general, on cabinet secretaries, Nobel Prize winners, brand name philanthropists, activists, artists. And while I am sure that Sherilyn is 
honored to receive this award today given that history. Mark my words, over the course of our lifetimes, this award itself will rise in esteem specifically because of its association with her. So, in closing, um, I am unbelievably honored to be asked to make these remarks today. I do not um, give public remarks. <laughs> I don't uh, give speeches. I don't appear at public events. Uh, I am allergic to award events of all kinds. But again, there is an exception. If it is Cheryl and Eiffel, the only answer is yes. Yes, I would be honored. Yes, I would do anything. So congratulations to the Radcliffe Institute on this choice. Sherilyn, congratulations. And thank you for teaching us so much and for leading us the way that you have and you continue to do. The country needs you now more than it ever has. None of us can wait to see what you do next, but we know that part of the way we're gonna learn from you is seeing how you redefine what happens next for you. Martha Minow is the 300th anniversary university professor, former dean of Harvard Law School. Our medalist today is Sherilyn Eiffel, the President and Director Counsel Emeritus of the NAACP Legal Defense and Education Fund. Please join me in welcoming them both. Carolyn, deep breath, take it in. It's all deserved. You honor us by being here. You honor us by your work. You honor us by your example. I thank Dean uh, Brown Nagin for giving me the honor of being here with you. My former boss, Justice Thurgood Marshall, is smiling. He is smiling, and boy, he was watching you <laughs> closely. I felt him. <laughs> <laughs> we have a lot to talk about. As Rachel Maddow put it so uh, clearly, uh, we're in trouble. And we're in trouble as a country. We're in trouble as a democracy. We're in trouble on any of the promises this country says it has made. Let's start, if we can, with the topic of the panel we had this morning. Let's start with equity and higher education. And of course, we can't talk about that without talking about K through 12, and jobs, and their relationship to democracy. Is there a step forward that you would hold up as what should be the focal point? Well, first of all, thank you so much, um, Dean Minow, and just for your work. I mean, Rachel just mentioned my reparations clinic. Your book um, was, a, was a key part of that. Um, and so I'm just, your work is so inspiring to me. Um, I'm gonna answer your question, but because I was raised right, I'm first gonna say thank you. Um, <laughs> thank you to Dean um, Tomiko Brown-Nagin, who's been such an extraordinary visionary leader uh, here at Radcliffe. Uh, Rachel Maddow, I don't even, I mean, that was amazing, and I thank you so much. I admire you so tremendously. I have not physically seen you in three years, so this is a treat. Um, and just thank you for your contributions and for, from time to time, giving me the mic. Um, it means so much to me. Brian Stevenson in absentia, my dear friend. Um, Brian is sitting there very uh, formally, and he's making me sound like I'm the funny one, but we have a ball on the phone together. He is incredibly <laughs> funny also, um, but there is no one more committed to justice and equality than Brian Stevenson, and I learned so much from him. He's a great colleague and friend. Um, I want to thank my family, my husband who's here. I want to thank my best friend who's here. I want to thank my three daughters who are not here, but who are always in my heart. Um, and as a way of circling back around to answer your question, I want to thank my parents and my nine siblings, six of whom um, are still living. Um, 
the reason that they connect with the question that you asked uh, is because um, they emphasized education above all. My mother uh, did pass away when I was quite young, but she taught me to read when I was four. Um, my father was about education. There wasn't really much you could do besides bring your report card that would um, make him happy or make him approve. And, um, and I wanted his approval. And as I said, I was smart. It happened to be the thing I could do really well. And, um, and he made me ambitious um, or allowed me to be ambitious. Mm. Uh, my father was extremely old fashioned, even around gender issues, except the belief that his daughter should do whatever they could do. Um, but the reason it's important is because I'm sitting here on this stage as though I am some singular and unique person, but I'm part of an ecosystem of these um, 12 people who are my family. And the question is, how do I end up here? And how did we all end up where we ended up? And it's a story about education. It's a story about infrastructure. It's a story about democracy. It's a story about um, investment in public life and public goods. Because what we were able to do in our family was only possible during a brief period of time when a few things were happening. Um, when there was an investment in public life, um, that the, the decade and a half that I was in K through 12 was the highest period of school integration um, and also the highest period of federal funding for education. Um, my oldest brother, the oldest in the family, became an electrician as my father had been uh, before he became a social worker. And because of the civil rights movement, he was able to make it into the local three union. Um, and that allowed him to um, do extraordinary work for his whole life, to buy a pretty nice house. Um, it was he who signed the promissory note for my loan, my student loan, so that I could go to Vassar College. I got a scholarship, but it was not a free ride. Um, not my dad, it was my brother, who because of his good union job, uh, had good credit and a nice house and could sign that promissory note. My older sister and brother went to City College of New York. The tuition each semester was $85. It was a registration fee. And we never could pay it on time. We literally struggled for the $85. But it could be done. Um, and they were able to graduate from an extraordinary four-year public college at the cost of $85 um, a semester. I have four sisters who were nurses, who all went to affordable public schools. They would have been lawyers too, but in the generation in which they were young girls, if you were yeah. super smart, they told you to be a teacher or a nurse. Yeah. Um, and I happened to be in the generation where if you were a young girl and you were super smart, you could be a doctor or a lawyer. And so my sister, who's a year older than me, is a doctor. Hmm. All of that is to say that um, it couldn't have happened without a certain way in which we were set up. I was in a place like New York, and so for a 35 cent token, I could travel from Queens up to Harlem where I had a summer job at some point to save money. Um, you could make it using the public infrastructure and the public goods that were available to you. We didn't go on vacations, but we went to beautifully maintained public parks. We packed our hampers and we went to Heckscher State Park and we went to Sunken Meadow and we went to Wildwood. Those were our labor days and our memorial days. Um, and so when I hear the panel this morning, um, which I thought was really excellent and um, offered some incredible insights and ideas, what I think I would offer is that the entire discussion about education needs to be reframed as a democracy discussion. That We are, in a, we are in a democracy crisis, and every pillar of civil society that holds up a democracy, education, the legal profession, journalism, um, fa the faith communities, yeah. you name it, um, the fundamental cracks in the foundation of all of those are on display for all of us to see. Not one of those problems will be solved independently. They will be solved as part of an ecosystem that includes housing and includes all of the pieces. So when I heard um, the conversation between Tony Carnival and, and Raj Chetty and others about 
you know, training and training people, you know, training young people in schools for jobs, um, I want to first just push back on thinking about education only as a direct connection to jobs. What, what, Chief, Justice, what Chief Justice Earl Warren said um, in Brown versus Board of Education which Dean Brown Nagin talked about earlier was that you, he, you couldn't imagine how a young person could be successful in this country without education. But what he also said was that education, and I'm quoting, is the very foundation of citizenship. The very foundation of citizenship. So when we see our democracy in a death spiral, which it is in, we have to be asking questions about education that are beyond does it prepare you to get hired by a corporation, right? And all of the questions about why we don't have a living wage and access to jobs are part of the democracy death spiral. I'll give you one example from Baltimore where I live most of the time and then I'll stop and let you ask another question. No, no, um, keep going, keep going. <laughs> when Freddie Gray was killed in police custody, um, which many of you remember, um, there was unrest in Baltimore for many days. The camera lenses were on Baltimore. It was an incredibly difficult and painful time. And um, a lot of us were asked to speak about his death and about policing. And of course, I was very involved in the conversation about um, the need to address police violence against unarmed black people, which I had been exposed to from the time you know, I was a child in New York when I was 10 and um, an NYPD officer killed another 10-year-old Clifford Glover. Um, but I insisted at that time on trying to connect what was happening around this particular issue with this young man, with Freddie Gray, to the other questions that we don't ask. And I was asking, so what <laughs> would have happened to Freddie Gray if he had not been killed by the police? Do you have any questions about where he would have lived, about whether he would have been able to get access to an education? You're talking about somebody who actually was functionally illiterate still. Um, would we have asked questions about where he would live, where he could get a job, and so on and so forth. And at the very moment that there was unrest in the streets around Freddie Gray, we had finally achieved something that black people in Baltimore have needed for a very long time, which was a plan for a rapid transit system that would go east to west, which is where black people live in Baltimore City. Um, you know, you go to most cities, you see like their rapid transit, and sometimes there's a map with a plan for additional stations. We don't have that. We have a train that has a few stops that go up to Johns Hopkins, and that's it. If you've been to Baltimore, you know what I'm talking about. We have these long, meandering buses that go through the city that make it take really long to get from one side of town to the other. So finally, we were going to get this, and it was important for jobs. So that if you lived on the west side, where Freddie Gray was killed, you could get to the east side, where Johns Hopkins is. And Johns Hopkins has jobs. And to their credit, they hire formerly incarcerated people as well. But the but the inability to get to your job, right, in less than an hour and a half if you live on the west side, or if you live on the east side and you want to get to the malls that are on the west side to get to your mall job, um, made it impossible for people to have access. So here we had finally this plan. We had the money. The Obama Department of Transportation had secured the funds. And the Republican governor of the state canceled the transportation line, the red line. And when we talked about the, the need to have this in, infusion of uh, cash in the city, he said, we just spent $100 million on the riots. And we opened an investigation. LDF filed a civil rights investigation. And then, of course, the election happened in 2016, and the Trump administration's Department of Transportation closed it. So what does that have to do with education? Well, it has to do with the 10,000 jobs, construction jobs. It has to do with the apprentice program that as part of the building of this rapid transit was going to be created in Edmondson High School on the west side. It has to do with the small business loans that um, folks were working on in the administration so that black people could start their own business, could, businesses, could run kiosks in the subway stations and so forth. So talking about any one of these issues as though they are independent of the larger democracy questions will never get us there. And I know this because the decision that was made by the governor to cancel the rapid transit line, he canceled that line in favor of infusing more money 
uh, into the Purple Line, which is in the suburbs of Maryland, and providing more highway funds. And so once again, the sacrifice of public transportation to what is privatization, getting in your car and driving down a highway, has consequences for young people, for low-income people, for mobility, for segregation. All of those things are of a piece. And um, that's why we're in a moment that I think has both, um, you know, it's, it's incredibly sobering <laughs> to be, to, to, to understate it, but it, there is also a moment of opportunity, Martha. Mm -hmm. If we are prepared to open our minds to understand how we got here and to understand that where we are is not sustainable if we want to live in a democracy, and I do want to live in a democracy. So I would just open up the conversation to include all of the component parts and to understand, because we've got some highly educated people, some who went to this institution, Tom Cotton, Ted Cruz. I mean, if I'm talking about democracy, democratic principles and ideals, it's not that they got education at a selective or elite, whatever you want to call it, institution. That, that's not necessarily the whole picture. Yes, we want people to be able to take care of their families, to live their best lives, to live their dreams, but we also want them to be able to participate as citizens in a democracy with all that that means. And so part of kind of my, my next chapter, Rachel, is to try to work on how we reimagine what it means to be a citizen in a democracy and how we undergird um, the capacity of people to participate as true citizens in a democracy. So much of what you said is so critical. I want to underscore the word we and the word democracy and also the word privatization, which I wish it weren't so clunky, but maybe that's what we have to stumble over. There seems to be a loss of a sense of we. Yeah of a commonality, of a common project. And you know, in many ways, this wonderful panel this morning was about that. It was about the carving out of separate institutions, separate pathways for people with privilege and money and uh, not available to other people because there's not a we. So you quoted the Chief, Chief Justice Warren yeah. and Brown. Where did we get off the track? What did the Supreme Court see in 1954? What has happened since? How have the failures to invest in a we contributed to where we are now? Yeah, so this is where it gets tricky. And this is why it's impossible to talk about the unraveling of our democracy and, and um, if we are to save it, how we save it, without talking about white supremacy and the embrace of white supremacy in this country. Um, there's a strain in, in this country that is quite, um, quite nihilistic. And as your question um, alludes to, it kind of begins with Brown, in, at least in the modern era. It, it goes back, of course, to the, to the 19th century as well. We had a public education system that um, white people were quite invested in. It helped many of your grandparents and great-grandparents and parents who were working class, who were immigrants, um, who did not own their own homes. And it was understood that that was a necessary public good for this country. It was only when the Supreme Court said that you would have to share that public good on an equal basis in 1954 that we began to have a crack in the, in the fissure of consensus around that view. The private academies that were created in the South by white parents who withdrew their children from the public schools, still wanted to use the public money, never forget that, to have these private white segregation academies, decided now that they did not need public school. And there has been a concerted effort to weaken and degrade public school because the Supreme Court said, if you're gonna have it, you have to have it on an equal basis. 
and what far too many white people in this country said, well then, you know, maybe we don't have it. <laughs> or at least maybe we're not a part of it. It's like white flight, right? Maybe we just don't live here anymore. Maybe we just move away. And the scary part is that that's what's happening with our democracy right now. All of the people who talked about the demographics of this country, all of the people who recognize that um, white people over decades will not become, will not be the driving force of running the country. The election of President Obama, which I think flipped the switch, basically said to those same people and those who are animated by that same view that if we have to share power equally in this democracy, then maybe we don't have one. Maybe I'm agnostic about whether we respect elections. Maybe I don't care about the peaceful transfer of power. Maybe I'm not willing to respect the outcome of the presidential election. Maybe I'm not willing to ensure that people who are citizens and eligible can vote. When they saw all of the folks out, millions of people out, multiracial, largest civil rights protests ever in the history of this country after the George Floyd video was seen, when they saw people around the world responding to this terrible crime. They saw the power of our shared empathy. That's another characteristic of the we. And they decided then that we will now pass laws that say that you cannot teach about any subject that might cause feelings of anguish or guilt on account of race. That's what those so-called anti-CRT laws say. They don't know what CRT is. What they say, if you look, read the actual statutes, is that they forbid the, the teaching of subjects that will create feelings of guilt or distress or anguish or shame on account of race or gender. And as I said uh, in a conversation with Hillary Clinton a few weeks ago, you may have had the same experience. When I was in the sixth grade, we read the diary of Anne Frank. And I felt guilt, I felt shame, I felt anguish, not because I did anything, not because anyone I knew had been a Nazi. As a human being, I responded to that story. I never thought about people who are intellectually disabled until I read Of Mice and Men in the eighth grade. And when those people, millions of people, came out on the street after seeing, in the middle of a global pandemic, I think we've forgotten how powerful a moment that was in this country. They saw the power of it, though. And they began to work immediately to try to shut off in our young people the valve of empathy. So there has been a concerted dismantling of the we. It didn't just like happen, how come we all used to, and we all used to, and we all used to. The other piece of it has been to taint that which is public with race. If you're honest with yourself and you think about public schools, what race do you think about? public transportation, public universities. And once in this country you taint something with the idea that black and brown people may be using it or benefiting from it, it becomes a place of disinvestment. And so all of this is part of how we got here and it's why I have insisted and I'm writing about the need for us to confront and untangle this embrace with white supremacy. It will not destroy just black people or brown people or Asian American people. It will not just mean that there is rampant anti-Semitism or that there's violence against members of the LGBTQ community. It will not mean that alone. It will destroy this entire democracy. What you saw on January 6th, it will destroy this entire democracy. And so I think the opportunity in this moment is that I, at least I'm hoping, that you can see it. That it's not just me in, in 1989 or 1995 or 2014 saying the same things I'm saying right now and having no one hear it. I hope you can see it. I hope you can see where we're headed.
and that that's the opportunity then to mobilize and marshal all of us, you know, not just civil rights lawyers or, um, you know, terrific scholars or progressive people or do-gooders, but just all of us if we want to live in a democracy. And of course, now that is a question. Yeah. You point to the laws restricting uh, the teaching of racial, uh, racial uh, history of truth, uh, you know, so ironic, as if there have ne never been students made to feel bad about their race in schools. It's just not the ones that are on the minds <laughs> of some of these legislators. You know, I feel though we're living at a split screen time. Yeah. Here at Harvard, we've just issued under the leadership of Dean Brown Nagin uh, the report on the legacy of slavery at Harvard, and thank you for, to President Bacow for authorizing that process. You know, and it's a call to action as well as a, a confrontation of real truths, a report that cannot be taught in 36 states in this country right now. That's correct. Um, your own work, uh, starting with your book on lynching, but to the present, can you help us locate this soul searching, this divided soul of America? And uh, is democracy the frame that is the uniter? Yeah, you're asking a really good question, and I confess at the, at the front end I don't have the answer to it because, um, you know, I talked about, um, you know, being inspired by Barbara Jordan, right, and, and seeing, you know, I, we were the kooky family that liked politics and, you know, watched every convention. The conventions are coming. We were excited. You know, I was like seven. And, um, <laughs> you know, so we were weirdos, you know, but okay, I get it, you know. <laughs> But you know, seeing her, and, and many black women have, have talked about this in, in my age uh, group, which is not important to talk about at this moment, but um, <laughs> you know, saw her during the Watergate hearings. And, and I will say for me, uh, it was the, you know, her power and her voice, and she, you know, she wasn't an entertainer. She was, there was moral authority there. And she, was, she would talk about, if you've ever you know, watched clips, the Constitution in that Absolutely. voice. You know? So I'm seven, I'm eight, right, maybe nine. <laughs> you know, what is the Constitution to be, right? But you know, I'm, I'm in school and I'm, but she would talk about it with a reverence. And so I admit I'm a sucker for this stuff. Like I, you know, when I say democracy, it just shivers, you know, I get really like all choked up, you know? And so I understand that that's not how most people respond to it. And so we may need some strategic communications <laughs> help in how to talk about this set of things. Citizenship has become fraught because of you know, the many, many challenges to un undocumented people and the, 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 the harsh and violent language of that. So I'm, I'm using terms that I recognize may not be the way it would be, that it would be best to talk about this publicly as a matter of strategic communications. I'm getting to the concept, which is, you know, do you want to live in a place um, where, as, you know, Professor Carnavali said, you can be your, you can be your best self, um, a, a place where there is some shared dynamic of um, what we are trying to accomplish together as a people. Um, and that requires a level of maturity. It doesn't, it doesn't actually require the highest level of education. My parents um, maybe completed high school, and the lessons that they communicated to us about who we were and who we were supposed to be uh, in this society had nothing to do with the fact that, of going to some elite institution. There were lessons about who you are as a, a, a person, and so when I was listening earlier, you know, I'm, it, I did get choked up because if, if those two brothers, my dad and Gwen's dad, you know, Im imagined that they could produce what, we, what we're talking about right here, you know, two people in the same family getting Radcliffe medals and um, they made us believe these things were possible. There was no reason to believe it any more than there was a reason for Thurgood Marshall to believe that he could break the back of Jim Crow. He wasn't living in a, in a it wasn't even a democracy. It couldn't, it, I mean, we had legal apartheid in half the country. So it wasn't even a democracy when he was doing this work, when Pauli Murray was writing and imagining, yeah. right, what um, the status of women could be, and particularly black women. 
or Ruth Bader Ginsburg or any of the people we think of as these pioneers. It wasn't, they were imagining something that didn't exist. So this moment, the opportunity is an invitation for us to imagine the democracy that we want. And I just get so frustrated when people say, you know, it's never gonna happen. How, what, what, could, what was happening in 1935 that would have made Thurgood Marshall think that he could successfully challenge segregation at the University of Maryland Law School where I ended up teaching for 20 years? What was happening, there was some wonderful thing. No, lynching was at an all time high. Like, what would have made them think it? And that's what keeps me turned on. You know, what keeps me turned on is that knowledge that people were working with, were making bricks out of straw. And they're the reason that you and I are sitting on this stage and that many of you are living where you're living and married to who you're married to and um, living in the neighborhoods you live in and all that stuff. Um, I admit it looks bleak, and I certainly don't want to leave the stage without talking just and saying something about Buffalo and Uvalde, Texas. Yeah. And how not only heartbreaking it is, but absolutely enraging it is. Another watershed moment. If you have lost the will to protect your elders and your children, what are you? What are you? So I think, I think if democracy may not be the buzzword for everyone, but if you want a world in which your elders matter, remember when everyone said, you know, in the beginning of COVID, not everyone, but certain people were saying, well, some, you know, the old people, they would have only lived another five years anyway. What? Is that the world you want to live in? And I remember saying to my daughter, my mother did pass away when I was five. Uh, so I do actually remember her. But one of the things I can't remember is the sound of her voice. If she'd lived five more years, right, I would remember the sound of her voice. When people say that to people, that they would have just lived two years or three years, or, what are we doing? So if this is not the moment in which we all feel driven to imagine outside of ourself um, what we can create and what we want, then there never will be one. And um, I, I just believe that it will happen. I truly do. I think that that belief um, is critical uh, so that people don't just give up. I also, you ma mentioned Barbara Jordan, you know, she talked about the promise, redeeming the promise, just want America to live up to the promise that it has made. So I do think there's, at least that's part of this in ingredient of reimagining what can bind us together. But you think if COVID doesn't bind us together, if the shooting of children doesn't bind us together. Um, there's something about the structures of our narratives that is part of the problem. Brian Stevenson talks about yeah. narrative, that we need a narrative of we, and we need a narrative of being implicated in each other's lives and uh, not translating things immediately into tribal disagreements. But, but Martha, we also have to see our own power. This is the part that I'm getting nervous about because you know we've been going through a lot of terrible moments, so it's understandable. Um, I, I feel pretty darn hopeful about the we in, in some measure. Think about what we did in 2020. We skipped right past it because it started to get so janky, you know, immediately in 2021. <laughs> but I mean, we were in the first part of a confusing global pandemic that was um, so scary for all of us. When people saw that video of George Floyd, millions of people went into the street. Even though we were told, we, we didn't even know, we were like, we have to stay away from each other. Remember, I was wiping down yep. you know, milk cartons. and everything. Remember, we were doing all of that. And all ages, all At races. All ages, all races, all 50 states. It was a powerful we moment. The 2020 elections, um, if I slept, one full night in 2020, maybe one. Um, it was a lot because we, we decided to be relentless. And I've said before that what kind of activated me was the Wisconsin primary when I saw all those black people in Milwaukee with the masks on, which you know to me was risking your life. This was the first week of April 
of 2020 to vote. And I thought, we well, got to do everything. And we started filing all this litigation around absentee ballots. And we did, I mean, I, I want to just say, I love the Postal Service. It's one of the public goods that I think we should invest in. It's really important. I love it. Love it. January 2020, they issued the Gwen Eiffel stamp. I was there. It was amazing. It was awesome. But in September 2020, we had to sue them. So, so, <laughs> so, so, because we needed to get the ballots delivered. But we did all that stuff. And the result of all of that was the highest turnout we've ever had in an election in this country, in a national election in this country. Not since 1911, because women couldn't vote in 1911, black people really couldn't vote in 1911. So ever, highest turnout ever in the 2020 election. <laughs> then, then, of the five million voters who turned out in Georgia, 97% of them turn out again for the special election in January, which is unheard of. I mean, I do elections. Special election, 97% of the voters who showed up for the presidential was unreal. Unreal. So the result of that election, the result of that election was the election of the first black senator since Reconstruction in Georgia, the second Jewish statewide elected official in Georgia. That was January 5th. And because of January 6th, we've kind of forgotten January 5th. But I insist that we remember that in 2020, we showed that we. We showed that we after George Floyd was killed. We showed that we, through the election process, voters in Fulton County, Georgia, black voters stood online for nine hours to vote in the presidential primary. We were the we. And if we forget our power, if we forget what we showed, then we will misdiagnose and not understand that what they are doing is they are responding to us. We created a world that they felt was getting away from them. We created a world that was beginning to have this sense of inclusivity around LGBTQ issues. We created a world in which the expectation was that there were certain things, racist things, that you couldn't say and that you had to behave in a certain way towards women. We were creating that, and that's what they're seeking to unravel. So in 2021, when we had January 5th, then we had January 6th, then we had January 7th, which is when the Georgia legislature announced that we are going to create this new commission, this election integrity commission in the state house that's going to create this new law, which was their voter suppression law. And you know it's responsive to 2020, because why else would you have the provision that says you can't give food or water to people standing online to vote if you didn't know about Fulton County and the nine hours that people stood online to vote? Right? Why would you have the anti-empathy legislation if you hadn't seen all those people out of their feeling of empathy coming out into the street? So it's important for us to recognize that you're right, and I wouldn't disagree, we have degraded a sense of public good, but we're we were clawing our way back, and that's what they're responding to, and we did it powerfully, and some at risk of their own lives. And I think that's huge and important for us to remember so we don't stop doing the things that were working. Because you might say, see, it didn't work. No, no, actually the voting did work, which is why they're so pissed off, you know? And the mobilizing did bring more people into the tent of something has to be done, right? So I just want to make sure that as we think about the new things, we don't let go of the things that we have been doing that have been restoring a sense of common uh, purpose and, and common commitment to um, bringing this country forward. Many people here, and I speak also for myself, want to know what can we do? Um, I'm going to say after this past week, take one day and rest and hug your loved ones. And um, this has just been really, really hard. Yeah. Um, Buffalo was really hard, Uvalde, Texas was hard, and um, not, nothing to compare to what you know, family members and parents and friends and those communities have gone through. And stripping us of our empathy and humanity is also part of the project of degrading our democracy. So we get to, um, we get to have a moment to do that, but only a moment. Um, and then we have to gather ourselves on their behalf and begin to think of what our points of intervention are. Um, the obvious ones you know, I'm, I'm sure everyone here who's eligible is registered to vote, and if you're not, I need to get the authorities, <laughs> because we, you've got to be registered <laughs> to vote if you are eligible, and so we know that. Um, but I want to say something about voting that I think is really important and that we don't talk about enough, which is um, 
that we, we not only need you to, to vote and to encourage other people around you to vote and not to say, I live in a blue state so it doesn't matter um, because, um, first of all, people do judge by turnout. And second of all, um, there are so many races on the ballot and the truth is we don't engage all of them. And um, myself included, you know that it's happened to you. You've gone into the voting booth, you voted, maybe if it's a presidential election for the president, but let's say the governor, maybe the mayor, maybe your senator, um, maybe your city council member, maybe the attorney general, then it says sheriff. Yeah. So you don't really know the <laughs> candidates and maybe it's a nonpartisan election, so there's no help there. And maybe you skip it, or maybe you guess. Then it says, judges, vote for three. Yeah. You, you've heard of one. In fact, you even know them. But you don't really know three of the six. And maybe you don't know the DA, and maybe you don't know who would be the best person for the Public Service Commission or the Agriculture Commission. Um, and so I have been in this mantra of leave no power on the table. One of the reasons that we're in the situation that we're in is that we have left so much power on the table. We have allowed ourselves to be swayed and convinced, and this is especially true of elites, that elections happen every four years. And we have allowed the political parties to hijack our sense of what it means to participate in an electoral process. And so if it's not partisan, we're not interested. And if it's not one of these high salience races, we're not interested. And meanwhile, the sheriff is the one who's gonna decide you know, on immigration issues, is the one who evicts people. Um, who is that awful sheriff in, in Arizona? Um, Arpaio. Arpaio, like odious. Um, and so we, we forget about those elections and why they're important. And we forget about judges and all these state Supreme Court races that are happening this year. We've begun to focus on DAs a lot more around the country. I hope people understand that school boards are kind of important at this point, right? So these are all the elections that we leave on the table. And so I just wanna encourage you know, us here in the family, I know you vote, but I'm pretty sure you don't vote in every race on that ballot. And you don't vote in every election, the special election and um, you know, all the one, the primary runoff and all the ones in between. So I wanna encourage all of us to get serious. We're in a moment where we have to get serious about power and we have to stop being so, you know, it's so indelicate to talk about power because we're about democracy. Yeah, well, power goes with it. And so I would encourage us to more robustly right. vote. But then I would go a step further and um, really talk about how we get our voices heard and our voices get heard not only by calling your senator, which I encourage each of you to do, no matter who your senators are, 202-224-3121. I mean, you should be able to call them every month. That should be in your phone. Just tell them how you're feeling about whatever's the latest thing. Whatever's the thing, hey, I saw that confirmation hearing and that was unacceptable. Um, the same. Whatever you think, whatever, whether it's about the infrastructure bill or whether, you, whether it's about guns or whether, whatever it is, um, to make it a regular practice of engaging, to go to these town hall meetings, to show, we've just seeded all these spaces. We're just too busy being so smart and we're watching all the MSNBC shows and so we can't be bothered going to the town hall. I mean, no, <laughs> seriously. I think we have to get a little bit more um, engaged and so I think that's important. I think we have to show up at district offices of our senators, they really hate that. And, um, and, member, and members of the House, and really let our voice be heard and really become participants um, and make sure that they're hearing from us. So that's just the initial thing. I do think we have to support candidates that we really like and we have to really support them, not just talk about it over coffee. Um, I do think we have to run, please follow that website, run for something, it's fantastic. Yeah. Um, you know some parent who should be on the school board. You don't have to have any specialized knowledge to be on the school board, you can run. You can, your cousin can run for city council. Um, I, I think it's important that we begin to encourage people that that's what they did. Um, and the results, uh, you know, are, are, are uh, checkered. Um, so I think we just have to, I don't think we're engaging the process of the electoral process and democracy in the way we talk about it. We talk about it as though it's like we have to help other people understand when we're actually not really doing it either. So I would, um, I would start there. 
I would, you know, talk about this, the narrative that Brian talks about and recognizing our own investment in narratives about, you know, the inner city and the urban and all of the buzzwords we've come up with to uh, not say black people. And, um, you know, and for those of you who have trouble talking to your uncle at Thanksgiving, I need you to talk to your uncle. He has a son who might have access to weapons. I need you to have courage um, and to, to carry forward the message and let people know where you stand on the piece of earth that you stand on. Um, and, um, and to look out for one another, to be allies. When, when Trump was elected, many people don't know this, but many of the various civil rights groups met, and we agreed that there would be no daylight between us. Because I, I, I didn't assume that Trump was gonna just try to burn the whole thing down. I thought he was gonna try to divide and conquer, right? And so we were very clear, you know, that the black groups and the Latino groups and the Asian American groups and the LGBTQ groups and the women's groups, and we were all gonna, there would be no, we would all come to one another's aid. And, and I'm, one of the things I'm proudest of is that we did That's that. That's true. It would be like a massacre and we would just be there for each other. So allyship, allyship around hate crimes, allyship is so important. Um, because when we do stand together, when we do come out on those streets, like we did after George Floyd was killed, it is a wave, it is, a, it is powerful. Um, it has tremendous potential that we haven't fully realized. You and I have talked about the pillars of democracy, and we've touched on several here yeah. today, elections, education. Uh, I, what about media? What about businesses? And if you want to say what you're going to do in your book, how much time do we have? This is a moment to say something about the book, because you've got some people who are going to read this book. OK, great. So um, uh, I think I'm going to, just in case we run out of time, I think I'm going to start with business, actually. Um, because I think this is really important. Business is also an aspect of, of civil society. And um, I think that business leaders have to make decisions about who they are. I don't mean uh, individually as a business leader. I mean, what is the role of a, of a business, particularly a corporation, in a democracy? So first of all, corporations are beneficiaries of democracy. They're beneficiaries, I have said, of the civil rights movement. You know, the whole story about America being a place of opportunity and equality and all the wonderful things that people say about it and people wanna come here and you can succeed and we don't have a class, all that stuff brought to you by yeah. the people who sacrificed um, during the Civil Rights Movement. What you could say about America in 1950 was completely different than what you could say after you know, black people could vote and you didn't have legal apartheid in half the country. So um, we kind of cleaned it up, you know? And that story allowed business people to p enter the world with a kind of imprimatur of democratic legitimacy behind them, right? to be the American business man or woman was quite something different, right, than mostly any other place. And it wasn't just about the money, it was about the story. So we should recognize that. Secondly, we should recognize that, um, I've always said that whatever, whenever we make progress for the marginalized, it redounds to the benefit of everyone. The first line you know, of the 14th Amendment, which is about birthright citizenship and um, naturalized citizens, which was created for the express purpose of restoring and ensuring citizenship for black people whose citizenship had been denied by the odious Dred Scott decision is the reason why in the 20th century waves of immigrants could come from Europe and in one generation they were American, right? Well, businesses have, as you know, um, used the 14th Amendment like crazy. Um, they have been deemed to be, be persons for purposes or citizens for purposes of the 14th Amendment, they are allowed to sue and... Um, Speech, religion. Citizens United, yep. <laughs> um, you name it. And the Supreme Court said this, said this, that corporations were persons and citizens for purposes of the 14th Amendment. Um, originally in, in a head note to a case in the uh, 1880s, I wanna say, that was like written by a clerk or something. Right. So the Supreme Court didn't actually say it in an right. opinion itself, but we've all operated under the theory and the Supreme Court has subsequently said no one would argue against the idea that corporations are, are citizens for purposes of the 14th Amendment. So they're using the 14th Amendment, the, the good, you know, that's the, that's the home run amendment, right? 
birthright citizenship, equal protection, due process. And if you keep really going down into the 14th Amendment, some real stuff that shows you that they knew that white supremacy wasn't going to die easily. And then the, you know, the mother load, the enforcement clause that says, Congress, you get to enforce this. I mean, it's, it's the one. It's chock full of all the stuff. They get to use it. So they're benefiting from this democracy. So what are their responsibilities? Saying that you're a job creator is actually not, I'm a job creator, I hire, well, used to hire attorneys at the Legal <laughs> Defense Fund and all kinds of members of the staff by growing the organization, you know, three times. I created jobs. Okay, I don't have a plant or a factory, but that's not actually enough given, given the benefits that business leaders get from this country. So we have to ask ourselves questions about who they are in a democracy. And I engaged in these very serious conversations in the two years prior to 2020 with Mark Zuckerberg and Sheryl Sandberg regularly about what their responsibilities were and are running this platform, um, about voter disinformation, the danger of the kind of hate speech being trafficked on the platform, and helping them understand what their responsibility was and that you can't come out and say you're responsible to the First Amendment but forget about the 14th, um, and that you can't pretend that you even know what you're talking about because you don't know what you're talking yeah. about, just like I don't know very much about algorithms. Um, and you need people in a company like that. You can't create what you're calling a public space without having any knowledge about how the actual physical public space was contested and fought over to ensure that people could participate equally. You can't just say, I'm gonna create a virtual one, not know anything about what happened in the physical one, and then be like, what? People are doing this to women on the platform? Oh, who knew? How could, we can't do anything about it. That would interfere with the First Amendment. No, that is irresponsible. And so I think this came to a head, um, you know, last year around the voter suppression laws and the things we asked companies to do to speak out. Um, and we've seen the backlash. We've seen Disney, Disney, yeah. right? Um, you know, being muscled by um, the governor of Florida and the legislature. So we understand business is in a tight spot, but let's have the conversation about what is the responsibility of American businesses. If you're functioning in a democracy, what's your responsibility to a democracy? All citizens have responsibilities to their democracy, just like we do. We always say the responsibility is to vote and so forth. What are theirs? And I think we have to begin asking that question. We have to ask what it means to be a fiduciary. Does it mean you can sell your company to just anyone, no matter what they are saying on social media or who they reveal themselves to be? Do you just have to hand them any platform that reaches 300 million people? Or do you have other fiduciary responsibilities? So I think that community yep. has to have that conversation. And I don't say this to just throw stones at them, because as I said, the legal profession, I've been talking about that, and you'll hear a lot more about that coming, has its own issues that it has to deal with, because we've been, we've not covered ourselves in glory, um, and I use the word we loosely. Some have not covered themselves in glory, and we have to grapple with that. The media has to do a forensic of what they got wrong in 2016, and how they are ill-prepared for this moment. Um, and, and I just don't think business can absent itself from that. They have to also be part of this reckoning. So We, we are going to draw this to an end with, I'm going to again plug the two forthcoming book because you can see why we need to hear more from Sherilyn. The response ability, the ability to respond, you exemplify that. You are the general for justice. We are so grateful and so honored Thank by your presence. You. Thank you. I am... Thank you, Martha, and thank you, Sherilyn, for that inspiring conversation. And now it's my honor, don't go, <laughs> to present Sherilyn with the 2022 Radcliffe Medal. I'll read the citation. She is an insightful scholar who confronts the painful truths in our nation's past to build a better future. She's an exemplary leader who understands when to step up and when to create space for others to rise. 
She is a strategic and tireless advocate who leaves no power on the table in her life's work to achieve equity and justice for all. And now, Cheryl Ann. <laughs> it's an afternoon now. It's an Yeah, we admire so many of your achievements. We admire you for inspiring us in the nation today, always. Thank you so much. Congratulations. And thank you all for joining us today. Please join me one more time in giving a round of applause to Sherilyn Eiffel. I, I, if I can just say, I also want to salute um, soon-to-be Justice Katanji Brown Jackson, just because it's not easy being the first. No. And we're so, 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 so proud of you and so thrilled that you're willing to serve. Have a good afternoon, everyone.